Hi friends, I'm LJ Jarvis, and welcome back to this rather different sort of video. You see how long this video is, it's a rather unorthodox kind of video, and that word is quite fitting for the subject of today's video. For today, me and Hubrick here. Hello everyone, I am Marshall Hubrick. I'm a history major and an all-around 40k enthusiast. Pleasure to be here, Louis. Thank you for having me. And thank you for coming on, good sir. The reason why I brought Hubert here is because today we're going to be sort of reviewing and analyzing the story of The Last Church, a rather little famous kind of Warhammer story, as it's not the typical story you might expect from a saying like 4AK, as instead of like Grand Warfare or stuff like that, it's rather a debate amongst the last, the last priest of Terra and the Emperor of Mankind during the end of the Unification Wars. Though I think this would technically have been i think the vacation wars have been long gone after during the events of this story i think i'm pretty sure they just around the emperor just pretty much finished with mm -hmm. them uh if i recall correctly when the story ends uh the emperor literally tells the uh, his troops i don't remember if they're if those are the thunder warriors or, or the custodies mm -hmm. i think they are the thunder warriors but I think that after that, um, they launch the Great Crusade and well, they leave Terra and go to space, which means those, which means those Thunder Warriors are not long for this earth. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, that last piece is on to interpretation. Like I had the idea that because it specifically mentions the plum on their helmets, I'm thinking they yeah. were custodians in the book because I'm thinking that the Emperor would have wanted to get rid of the Thunder Warriors long before his actual plans on starting the Great Crusade, because I don't think it would be smart to have the Thunder Warriors all excited, oh, we're going to go into space, only to been only to just be killed out then. Like I think in the animated version it's the Thunder Warriors, though so again, that is some true interpretation, because maybe Oriya just doesn't know what a custodian is. Or maybe he can tell the difference when he sees a gigantic <laughs> uh superhuman warrior, they all look the same to him. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of things interesting about the story. And it also shows that people have really found value in this because it's been done through essays, it's been done through podcasts and videos such as this one. It's definitely one of those 40k stories that uh, transcends its status as a short story because when you consider that this is a when we have this whole um book publisher that is black library that has this um these extensive novels with uh gigantic apocalyptic battles that cover entire planets and these horrific scenes of carnage and horror uh, a, a sh little short story about the emperor and a self-proclaimed priest on terra having a discussion on a rainy night seems a bit a bit too small for uh, the 40k scale we're all used to yeah and i would definitely say say that maybe if this was a book then i think maybe we could have gone to more depth with a subject like this but at the same time i think it also works as a short story and i th think this is also an important thing to bring up that graham nick neal when he was writing a story he didn't write it with the pursuit of you know, doing an essay on a subject like this, because you can obviously tell that this is sort of thing that if you want to be, if you really want to go deep into this, then I think you have done more than some of the arguments that the emperor has provided in the story, because they do seem maybe it's weak up good word. Cause they, but they aren't certainly original. Yeah, most definitely. I feel like Graham McNeil himself, um, he's a great author. Mm -hmm. I'm myself. I'm reading through A Thousand Sons right at this moment. Awesome. A great, yeah, great book. I, I've been enjoying it immensely. Um, I would let it later say if Magnus did something wrong or not, <laughs> but he did nothing uh, right. <laughs> he did nothing right. I'll, I'll stand judge. Uh, I'll be the judge of that, but he's a witch. So. <laughs> I don't like witches. Um, so Graham McNeil himself said that he wanted the story to be like uh, among the lines of, oh, Uriah is the one that you kind of sympathize the mm -hmm. most with because he's kinder, he's more polite, he's more down to earth. 
mm-hmm. uh, and the emperor being the one you kind of disagree with because the emperor comes along as this arrogant, self-entitled uh, uh, tyrant. But at the end of the day, he kind of like he wanted to the emperor being kind of you concluding that the emperor was right and Uriah was wrong, which in, in the context of the story, while the ar- emperor's arguments are uh, as to why religion is bad, that's pretty much the whole debate of the story. Mm-hmm. Um, to be fair, Uriah himself doesn't make very good counter arguments either. He, it's very well established that, that Uriah isn't a, a priest that actually got the education a priest needs to have. It's a self-appointed priest that he only kind of wings it as to how he practices religion. No? That does kind of seem like the case. And when I was reading through the story again and rewatching the animated story that Games Workshop took down only for a fan to bring back up and for them to not do anything. So it's like that was a waste of the guy's time. But uh, Games Workshop IP stuff aside, I think in the story, or from at least from what I understand, that there is a Congress, and if that's a good word for it, I'm not sure what you would call that for, you know, a gathering of like worshipers in a church like that. Congregation? Congregation, yeah. So I think there was a congregation, like there are a congregation of worshipers, yet I maybe it's not the same, but I, I do think you are right on that, that Araya isn't a real priest, and maybe the congregation was what was either from the Church of the Lightning Stone. And considering that the time period that this takes place, I would imagine that the actual church organization would have been fallen like a long time ago. Yeah, that doesn't mean like each individual church wouldn't just automatically stop running or anything like that. Yeah, most likely. Um, def- most definitely, most churches w- uh, and most religious organizations wouldn't, in fact, uh, stop functioning. They most likely would be kind of in an apocalyptic setting like 40K. They, I think, on the contrary, like individual local churches would kind of simply grow because people are well scared for their lives you know so mm-hmm. they will try to find comfort in their respective religions and there's actually something about that that i'll probably bring up later on in the video about the idea of when people find out they're mortal they will try to seek something else that something material wouldn't really provide so i i think it's well established that within the last church the church that the emperor goes to is obviously the catholic church because of the symbolisms within the church itself and you know graham mcneil confirming that yes this is a sort of maybe off branch of the catholic church okay so actually inside in the inside the story itself it's kind of referenced that the lightning church uh, the the church of the lightning stone uh it's actually kind of like referenced that it's built atop the the place where Linda's farm used to be, like the monastery that the Vikings raided in the early Middle Ages that oh, yeah. kick-started the whole Viking age. Mm-hmm. It's kind of referenced inside the story. And yeah, you're definitely right, Lewis. It is Christianity. It is Catholicism. You know, you, you know it. I know it. Everybody knows it. Like people have said that, oh, it doesn't have any like explicitly uh, Catholic symbolism of it, but come on, yeah. the emperor tells Uriah that, oh, your religion went on crusade. Yes, yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah, yes, it is. Yes, we all know it. Yeah, because I don't remember something like Mormons existing at that time doing such things. So, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, <laughs> definitely. And with something like 40k, they obviously bring like. Like the miscon the almost caricature of medieval medieval Catholicism for an event like 40k because it's obviously that the ecclesiarchy is the sort of parody. I hear that word so often when people are describing Warhammer, but it is obviously a parody of Catholicism. Because come on, the ecclesiarch himself looks like the Pope and warrior nuns and all that kind of stuff. The Astartes are knights and it mixed with angels. Mm-hmm. The emperor himself kind of sort of looks like Jesus. Uh, 
You- yes, definitely. Uh, even before the ecclesiarchy, like the goddamn the the goddamn spaceships look like yeah. flying cathedrals. Uh, what what was that about, Emperor? You didn't didn't you say something about religion being bad? Why your why do your spaceships look like that then? <laughs> Well, art is art, and we can't go <laughs> conquering the galaxy without the bling. And there are definitely stuff that I really, yeah, there's like soul symbolisms within the story that I really did like. Like, um, what I really kind of liked, where it kind of subtly tells how bad Terra has become, where they were describing the Marianas Trench. Is that how you call it? Yeah. Yeah, where. It, but it's no longer called the Marianas Marianas Trench. Sorry if I can't pronounce it right, guys. But now it's called the Marianas Canyon. So that tells you how much Earth has changed with all the oceans being almost gone. Yeah. Oh, you pronounce it very well. N- don't fret. Hmm. Now, when talking about something like religion and a story like this, of course, it's going to get messy. And if it's not politics that can make things toxic, it's definitely the subject of religion because we all have Thanksgiving dinner and we all know what it's like when the uncle or aunt bring up politics or religion. So we all have the experience of how toxic that kind of stuff can be. Yes, most definitely. Um, I don't think uh, I don't think we've been very well educated in how to treat these types of subjects in public discourse, if you get my meaning. <laughs> yeah. And people will, we t- I think we talked about this before and earlier in the stream is that, yes, the argument of, yes, the actual religious debate within a story is not the strongest side, but like you've said and before, that Graham Nick Neal didn't write the story in the pursuit of, you know, creating an essay because with the context is this is a short story and Let's be honest here. It's a Warhammer story. Like, if you really want to have the hardcore subject of religion debate or something like that, then I don't think turning to 40k will provide that answer because it's a tabletop game at the end of the day. Yes, I think there are far, far more qualified places to look for these kinds of answers in <laughs> in our world. Yeah, because at the end, Games Workshop's job is to you know provide models and provide expensive models and people to read their stuff. It's not like there's definitely value to the universe is saying like, there's definitely like they do try to do stuff like symbolism or philosophy and stuff like that. But at the end it's not that deep and nor should, yeah. nor should it be expected to. Yeah, most definitely. Um, most of the, most people I think, well, I think at the, at some point, all people kind of like come to 40k um, exactly for the ultra violence and the epic scale battles more than any type of philosophical rambling, mm-hmm. which like I, I, like I said earlier, it's, I, I appreciate it. Like I like that uh, the, I like when a franchise is, tries to elevate itself by touching kind of sort of difficult questions or things that can be messy that's like that's always appreciated in in my eyes because it it gives it more value like you said but at the same time it let at the same time yes if you're looking if you're looking for those kinds of answers in a store in this type of story i don't think you're gonna find them yeah and Maybe I'll be frank here. I think South Park tackled this subject better than I think the sword story could because the Emperor's main arguments within the story is that if religion just didn't exist or if it had no influence in society, then there would be no wars or persecution. And like, I'm not blind. Religion has definitely done that in the past and people were certainly persecuted because of that. Either most definitely, most definitely, yeah. Like either it had power, or the government used religion as a crutch to use it to, you know, like I said before, persecute people that it didn't like. Yeah, at the same time, I it's very ignorant to say that no political system or people just aren't never violent ever if if religion just didn't exist because that's de- just not true. Yeah, most definitely. Um, like. I agree with you on that. Definitely religion has been used for those types of stuff, but 
on the one hand, I don't think it's been done as often as people like like the emperor tries to claim it has, like I, as if to say, oh, if there wasn't any religion ever, then everything would have been all right. Like we will all be friends and everything would be wonderful. And yeah, no, that's that's not we, people do not need religion to be violent or to be vile. In fact, all the contrary, if uh, in in my opinion, that's all the co- all the contrary. In fact, um, here's the thing about the emperor's argument on that: the most violent wars, the most horrible per- perse- persecutions, most of them are hap- have happened very recently, or mm-hmm. well, recently in historian historian terms, like where eighty years is recent. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And those two conflicts and those two bloody bloody wars and conflicts were called World War One yeah. and World War Two, and all and those were strictly secular. The reasons were strictly secular conflicts. They happened for secular reasons, for politic political, for ideological reasons. But religion had not had. Pretty much nothing to do with that, with the cal- with the causes belli of those wars, and those are the two biggest bloodbaths in our history. So, from the get go, when you take that into consideration, I think that that the the emperor's argument doesn't start holding up very well when you consider that when you consider that. Yeah, and there was even a time when Oriya acts so. Will be so different if a secular government used this power to either persecute people or if it chose to start wars. And when the emperor was asked, he just like almost dismissed it, saying, "You just don't understand. Because religion was used as a crutch to do this stuff, that means it's too dangerous to have around." But you didn't answer his question. Like, you don't have to be religious to be an extremist or something like that. Because in, in World War One, when the Duke of Archduke, Archduke of Austria Hungary. I can't say his name because it's yeah. Franz uh, Ferdinand. Yeah, thank you. Um <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, no worries. It's like the Black Hand wasn't like I from my understand, the Black Hand wasn't a religious group. It was a political extremist group. Like you don't yeah, have Yeah, it was a national. It was nationalistic, yeah. Yeah. Religion wasn't used as a crutch during that time. It's this was, like you said, a strictly government thing, and even before then, things were ruining. Like there was eventually going to be a conflict. It was just like the Black Hand basically pushed it into existence. Yeah, pretty much. Um, the past wars before World War, uh, uh, World War One, even like the the Franco-Prussian War or even the Napoleonic Wars. All of them were ex- ex- were very wars for very basic reasons, such as political ideology, who gets to be in power, which where does the border of one starts and where the border of the other one ends. So, and those were the biggest conflicts in the world at the time, Long, uh, far removed from the days when religion was um, the main cause of belly, and even even then. It was still a rarity, something will I will, that I will get to later um, when we this when we discuss this in a more precise manner. But mm-hmm. it's safe to say that yeah, the emperor doesn't make a good case for that. Be- doesn't take a genius to kind of like reason that well, World War One, World War Two, and the Holocaust and the Holodomor and all those and all these modern uh, genocides and persecutions and atrocities. All of them were modern and secular. Like, and so when the greatest example of the horrifying atrocity that the emperor provides is just plain incorrect, when what does that, what does that, uh, what does that make the rest of the argument? Yeah, it's like he almost seems to have like a perfect memory of stuff like the Crusades and Inquisition, but it's like, were you just not awake during the 20th century, my man? Like, do you not know what was happening during World War One, World War One, World War Two, or even the Soviet Union? 
Or, yeah, most definitely. Or less, this is the argument someone will make like, oh, but what if it's an unreliable narrator? <laughs> we hear that way too much in the Warhammer community, I think, when it comes to stories. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, the old unreliable nar- narrator. As someone who has to work with unreliable nar- narrators all the time, they're... Thanks to the subject I, I studied, mm-hmm. um, the way it's, it, you would kind of expect someone to, like the emperor, to have not only a perfect memory, if you have all these other powers, and to kind of like, like the emperor himself. Here's the thing. The emperor, I think, uh, uses mostly examples from the Middle Ages and the Renaissance to justify us, the, oh, why religion has to go, and if we hadn't had that, then it wouldn't, we all be, we will all be all right, you know? Uh, complete, like you said, completely ignoring, like, the, the entirety of the 20th century, where, where the age of gigantic industrialized warfare began. Mm-hmm. And, uh, earlier in the, er, earlier when we were talking, Earlier, you said that the um, that context was one of the most important things. Uh, one of the most important things you need one needed to consider, and you're absolutely right. Uh, in when it comes to history and the past, context is of the essence. Mm-hmm. One, when looking at history, when looking at the past, if you cannot look back at the past using the lenses of uh, of the modern day, because then you will not understand the past. Mm-hmm. I'm telling this in a context of, of the real world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> See what I did there. Um, the emperor being a nigh immortal, super powerful being, would he himself know, be- know better? But at the same time, he, um, for reasons we will discuss later, he kind of misses the very fundamentals about being human at the same time mm-hmm. while calling himself just a, just a normal guy. Oh, I'm not a god, just a normal man. But he kind of like misses one of the core fundamentals of what it means to be human. So I think, uh, but I think we should leave that for the end if I, but most definite, but the emperor himself doesn't make the best the best point in general especially when he considers to when he ignores the entire the entirety of the 20th century and simply and simply focuses on medieval and rena- and renaissance and renaissance examples for his argument especially if you consider how he just dismisses Arias very fair question because in when it comes to our historical reality that's what Uriah asked the emperor. It's actually a very, very relevant to, to the historical reality of the 20th century with World War One, World War II, the Holocaust, the Holodomor, you, you know. I do have to ask about stuff like, about the emperor's ar- main arguments. Whenever he brings up like the men- the subject of well, it's because of your faith, Oriah, that stuff like the Crusades and Inquisition happened. Like, I understand the, like, I can, like, I know about the first three Crusades. Like, I know the context of them, of why they started and ended. For the audience who might not be aware, why exactly did the Crusades happen? Because it's, I think people seem to get mis- the idea, have the idea that it just happened just because. Like, yeah. Okay. First of all, context mm-hmm. we do not look at the past we like i said not looking at the past with uh gl- with 21 with 21st century glasses you know mm-hmm. um here's the thing nothing just happens mm-hmm. like things don't don't happen in a vacuum things happen for a reason mm-hmm. no n- no nation no ideology no religion no no war, no social movement, anything simply happened just because someone one day woke up and say, Hey, let's go do this, you know? So the, the, the reason why the crusades happened and most, uh, and most of the best historians on the, on the subject agree with this. The crusades happened in the, during the high middle ages 
after centuries of Islamic expansion upon Christendom. Now, Christendom is was or is in some ways this uh, collective idea of all Christian nations. Like we're all we're all we're all different nationalities. We have Castilians. We have uh, we have French. We have Germans. We have Englishmen. We we have Norwegians, etc., but we're all Christians, so we all make one this gigantic collective, you know. We're Norwegians. Uh, we're so Nor- Norwegians. I thought they were pagans during that time. Like the Vikings were long after the Crusades. No, uh, the Vikings happened in the early Middle Ages. By that time, it's been a couple of oh, centuries yeah, right. since since uh yeah, yeah. most of the most of the vikings converted like even oh, yeah. well they were still by by that time a little bit before that right along the time on when william the conqueror conquered england mm-hmm. uh like there were still people that you could norsemen that you could like look look at them and qualify as vikings but they themselves were already christians in their faith so yeah, and right. so Technically, there were still Vikings, but the old raiding, but the old days of massive raids were mm-hmm. like long gone. The descendants of a Viking chieftain that settled in the north of France and uh, that eventually went to be called Normandy were the descendants of Vikings, but they themselves were already like Christians and like, well, Harking back to William the mm-hmm. Conqueror, they will be the ones that would conquer England when the where the great heathen army failed. Um, um, but here's the thing: the Crusades happen after centuries of uh, Islamic expansion upon lands upon Christian lands, uh, mostly lands of the of the Roman Empire, or as we know it today, the Byzantine Empire. Mm-hmm. The Byzantine Empire still considered itself to be the... The Romans, yeah. The Roman Empire, yeah. Mm-hmm. We uh, we are not the... The Byzantine Empire, it's a uh, later name given to distinguish between the ancient empire with like, with like Augustus and Trajan and and the empire that survived into, into the Middle Ages. Okay. Um... The thing, the thing about this is that Islamic expansion was incredible in the sense that it was very fast and it happened very fast. And within a, within a generation of Muhammad's death, you know, the prophet on, of Islam, mm-hmm. um, the, the Arab tribes that, that left the, uh, Arabic peninsula, conquered Syria, Egypt, and the entirety, and Persia as well, in the entirety of the area that's Mesop- Mesopotamia. Mm-hmm. And the thing is that after that, the Umayyad Caliph, the, the Umayyad Caliph invaded Spain and conquered almost all of it, except for a part in the northwest called Asturias by... Uh, during by 732 um we had uh muslim expeditions crossing the pyrenees you know the mountains that divide spain and france and and having to be stopped their invasions having to be stopped by charles martel which is which was charlemagne's charlemagne's grandfather which is kind of funny because martel means the hammer so mm-hmm. the guy was literally named charles the hammer <laughs> And that's an awesome nickname. Um, so it was after centuries of, of, of Islamic expansion that, that the idea of the crusade started brewing because now the Christendom had to face, had to face themselves a quote about, oh, well, our, we're all Christians here. We're all, we're all supposed to follow the, the, the law of our Lord, but at the same time, the, our govern, our governments, you know, our princes, our dukes, our kings, well, also they have an obligation to, to protect, to, pro- to protect, uh, their kingdoms and their people, you know, and to protect the lands of their forefathers, all of that. So, um, here I'm going to. Sorry, Luis, I, I got lost again. I'm not used to this. Yeah, no problem, man. No problem. 
uh, yeah. So it was after the um, during when the Umayyads con- conquered um, when the Uma- when the Umayyads conquered most of Spain and the surviving Visigoths, the ones that were in Spain before that, started slowly but surely pushing back with this idea of the Reconquista. A lot of like the clergy was like, oh, this land. These lands were consecrated to our Lord, and they were consecrated to to Christ and and His Church. It's not right that, that infidels, a hostile faith to ours, for it's not right for them to rule over them. We need to take them back. We we need to take them back. This is this is, this land belongs to us by our right, be because because these lands are consecrated are consecrated to our Lord, basically. Mm-hmm. So. The thing is, the with the with the Crusades, it took centuries of Islamic aggression to for them to for the Church and all of Christendom to kind of like reconcile this idea the the ideas of of Christian of Christian forgiveness with warfare. Like it was obvious that they needed warfare to in order to defend themselves. You cannot have a country. That doesn't have an army that can defend itself from invaders, you know. But um, the idea of a crusade was um, it was a mixture of Saint Augustine's just cause, uh, just war theory, which estimated that war, in order to be righteous, needed to be reactive. You couldn't be like the you couldn't be like the aggressor. You couldn't be righteous if you just wanted to conquer all this stuff to get rich you know Mm -hmm. it had to be reactive you had to be if you went to war it had to be to to punish an evil or to correct a wrongdoing or to liberate oppression those those sorts of stuff Mm -hmm. you know that sort of stuff you know and every action has a sorry sorry uh, every action sorry sorry uh every action has a equal to opposite reaction basically basically yes so so we have uh, by the time the emperor uses the the argument of the oh uh, when the your religion to Uriah he, he tells he says to Uriah oh your religion went on crusade first it killed uh, first it killed all it slaughtered all of those who opposed the war and then they. And then they slaughtered the Holy See. They they were going to liberate. Okay, first of all, like I know that the emperor says it, like says it, says it, like <laughs> sorry, uh, says it like this, mostly because it's been millenniums since the events, you know. So he's being sort of vague. It's it's obvious. It's obvious as the reason, but the emperor sort of. First of all, the opposers of the war he's talking about were not opposers of the war. Those were, those were, um, plundering and massacres that happened to, uh, Jewish communities in the Rhineland, but those massacres were unsanctioned by the crusade. They were done by pets, by peasant rabble and very poor nobility who pretty much so when the first Crusade was called by Pope Urban II on 1095, um, said like, took advantage of the situation and, and they pretty much raided, uh, and massacred a bunch of Jewish communities among the Rhineland in Germany. The thing is, the church condemned these attacks very severely. And even the bishops, the, the very local, local bishops themselves, had to shelter shelter the Jews uh, in inside the their houses or their palaces. Some even hired mercenaries or paid off the invader the the attacking rabble, you know. Mm-hmm. And then the and then when they reached Hungary, they were slaughtered by the Hungarians. They were not even they were not sanctioned. They went completely against orders, and it wasn't so much so that they aren't even considered as part of the crusade. And no, and the church didn't approve of that also. And here we're going to the good part, the, the siege of Jerusalem. Oh yeah. The, uh, yes. the, the, uh, f- famous one that people like to bring up, like the, 
I don't know his name, but he, they always describe him as having like blood up to his ang- up to his knees, and people like to always amplify that. I don't know the context of that, so can you explain what that what the whole thing is? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> okay, look. First off, the um, the this idea of the of the capture of Jerusalem by the by the first crusade as being the worst thing ever is mostly comes from two sources. It comes from well, enlightenment. I say that in quotation uh, propaganda because a lot of the dark age myth that the emperor is kind of using to justify his yeah. arguments come from there. Um, but also from the from the from Muslims themselves, especially Saladin during the 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 third crusade. one of the protagonists of the of the of the third crusade yeah. and one and the rival of Richard the Lionheart, mm-hmm. um, he used he used uh, this chronicler a lot of some chronicler chroniclers uh, used. Uh, more vivid and more dramatic descriptions of the siege to, to kind of use it as a propaganda tool, as a rallying cry to rally Islam against the, against the invaders, you know? It's like we see plenty of debates. That, that's a debate to- topic that people, debate tactic that people use today. They like to amplify things to make it sound worse than it seems. It's, it, if that's where you're trying to go at, yeah. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Um, so, the first, so when you like I said, we need to put the things in context. I know we're repeating that mm-hmm. word very much, but that word is very important. Context does um, matter. <laughs> yes, especially in history. So here's what happened: the Crusaders had uh, gone through 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 hell and high water to reach Jerusalem. Uh, the Crusade had met with had been in the edge of disaster several times before reaching the their objective and they were finally here so what happened well the crusaders while still a, a strong army um here i think using my sources um the crusaders what happened is that when they find where they were reduced in number they were still um considerable force to be reckoned bit with but they were reduced in numbers and they were running low on supplies when they're finally when they finally reached Jerusalem what happened uh the Jerusalem at that time was ruled by the mighty Fatimid caliphate um the Fatimids um the Fatimids themselves were um were not the original not the original objective for which which the, which the crusade was called the crusade was called because well all the previous centuries but also because the byzantine emperor asked the pope for aid because they were being uh, encroached upon by a new power in the region called the seljuk turks mm-hmm. so the fatimids were enemies of the turks they had the previous year they had themselves taken R- jerusalem from the Turks. So the, so the Fatimids were like still new to the city in a way. Um, the, the Fatimid governor, uh, had, he- had, um, heard of, <clears throat> sorry, mm-hmm. had heard about how the crusader had, had taken Antioch, the previous city that the crusader sieged. Antioch was a mighty fortification, but the crusaders managed to defeat the Turks and take the city because the Christian population of the city, when they, when they, uh, when they themselves heard that an arm, that a Christian army was outside, outside the gates, they will, they aided the crusaders in, well, they aided the crusaders in like, in fighting the, into falling upon the garrison, the Turkish garrison, while the crusaders will fight, fought them. And to prevent this, to prevent this, the Fatimid governor, what he did was expel the Christian population from Jerusalem. So literally the Christian population of the city, literally walking, runs into the crusade. And what they do is they give them information on the city's defenses, the situation, and they tell them that the Fatimid governor had stripped the countryside of any goods that can be used for supplies, and they had poisoned all the wells. 
So there were loans. Of, the supply situation was bad then. It was horrible now. It was now horrible. When they finally reached Jerusalem, what happened is, okay, they heard that the Fatimid governor, governor had called for aid from the rest of the caliphate. So an army was being mustered and was coming from Egypt. The only thing that the Fatimids had in the Fatimid garrison had to do is hold out, hold out for like a month, two, maybe three at the most. Uh, and they were prepared. They had made all the necessary preparations. They were well supplied with water and provisions. And the army and the Crusader army wasn't really in a position to, to really com- wait out the siege. So what the siege, the city will, would have to be taken by assault or it would not be taken at all, mm-hmm. basically. And you see, nobody likes fighting sieges. Nobody. I mean, why? Because sieges are always messy. They're always messy because, because A, the attacker needs to bring more men to completely encircle the city. Because if you have to take the city by assault, it's going to result in more casualties because we're all, they're all packed together on the streets of the city, fighting street to street, all all bunch up together, no, not many places to move and maneuver. Sieges are always messy, especially if the sieges are taken by assault. It's always preferable to wait out the siege or starve them out or give them terms, ask them to surrender. So when the Crusaders finally took the city, by the standards of warfare of the era adhered to by Christians and Muslims alike, because because the city hadn't surrendered, they would have been justifying killing everyone in the city. But they didn't. In fact, here I have uh, the whole runs blood running up to the... Look, here I have a quote and some quotes about... It. Um, uh, oh, okay. The Gesta Francorum, one of the chronicler, one of the records of the First Crusade, Describes the slaughter as our men, our men waded in blood up to their ankles. Raymond of Aguilias, another first crusade chronicle, chronicler, wrote, men rode up in blood up to their knees and brittle reins. Okay. First of all, it doesn't take a genius to know that this is quite literally impossible. Hmm. Like this is simply not. Possible? It's absurd. Like it's not pool or anything. It's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's impossible. So, what happened is that what happened is that while the Crusaders did sack the city, and while the Crusaders did did in fact um, did in fact put a considerable number of people to the sword, it was a, it wasn't a very how do I say this? Um, it's, it's not as um, horrific as people might have portrayed it to be. Yeah, it's not an unprecedented event or consi- or extraordinary. Um, why? Because not only is a myth that they killed everyone, mostly because we know that people were given, were allowed to buy their freedom after the battle ended, which was a normal practice on the Middle Ages. You capture some prisoners and you ask them to and you ask a ransom for them. This happened all the time. Not only do we know that that happened, but we know that the later, the later, um, the later records of other chroniclers that put the numbers up on to completely ludicrous quantities are done like almost a century or more later. Like I, like I said, mostly by, by Saladin, mostly. Uh, as a rallying cry. Uh, and here's the thing. Uh, I'm going to read you a um, quote from one of my favorite crusader, stor- crusader historians. Sorry. By the standards of the, by the standards of the time adhered to by both Christians and Muslims, the crusaders would have been, the crusaders would have been justified in putting the entire population of Jerusalem to the sword. Despite later highly exaggerated reports, however, that is not what happened. 
A great many of the inhabitants, mo both Muslim and Jews, were killed in the initial fray. The best modern estimates put the number of dead between three and 5,000 people, including... Uh, sorry, <clears throat> I don't know. Th three and 5,000 people. Yet many others were allowed to, purcha to purchase their freedom or were simply expelled from the city. Later stories of the streets of Jerusalem coursing with... Coursing with knee-high rivers of blood were never meant to be taken seriously. Medieval people knew such, such a thing to be an impossibility. Modern people, unfortunately, unfortunately, often do not. The thing is, the stories about blood running up to their knees, it's literally, it's literally a quotation from the Book of Revelation. Mm. So it shows the disconnect between modern people and medieval people. Medieval people, the moment they heard about this, oh, the book of Revelation, most of the chroniclers on the Christian side of the, on the Christian side of the conflict themselves were clergymen that used the chroniclers as pretty much a method to teach moral lessons and as an, and an exaltation for the victors that were their patrons, the noble lords that carried out the crusade. Those were Raymond of Toulouse, Godfrey of Bouillon, uh, and Bohemond of Taranto. Mm. So, yeah, like, those, uh, those, uh, chroniclers are pretty much not, uh, very reliable as to, as to when you're looking for, ex for exact measures on what exactly happened, because they're, the purposes of their chroniclers is more to tell a moral story and more than tell a careful documentation as, as to as to why actually happened during the siege. Um, for example, uh, another thing here's a quote from uh, the mu uh, Muslim one of the earliest Muslim chron chroniclers, uh, Ibn Al Kalanisi was his name from his Damascus Chronicle of the Crusades. He describes the siege in very simple terms, actually. Um, let me look. Okay. Here says he is one of the oldest uh, sources we have for the First Crusade. It's believed that he was a contemporary, although it is unknown if he took part in the fighting. <clears throat> the townsfolk descended from the wall at sunset, whereupon the Franks renewed their assault upon it climb up the tower, and gain a footing in the city wall. The defenders were driven down, and the Franks stormed the town and gained possession of it. A number of the townsfolk, townsfolk fled to the sanctuary of David, and a great host were killed. Well, that's not the entire letter, but that's pretty much the description of the siege. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, I just want to bring back something you brought up earlier. Um, how many people did you say died during the siege of Jerusalem? Because this is important. Like I'm going to bring something yeah. up from the last church. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. Let me. I just just want to know this name. The name of this chronicler, Ibn Alathir, who is another Muslim chronicler, chronicler from. That's more of among the along the lines of contemporary with Saladin. You know, uh, he's one of the later chroniclers. It said the numbers were up among 70,000 70, people. Oh. But these numbers are ridiculous. They're, they're, it is impossible that Jerusalem had had that, pop, that many people at that time and in that time period. Uh, modern estimates put the casualties, including the army, the garrison, between 3,000 and 5,000. So while it is still a massacre, a massacre. Yeah. It's still, it's still a sacking. It was the norm, basically. Why do they do that? Because when you're sieging a city, like I said, nobody likes sieges. So it's always the best uh, option to have the city surrender without fighting because the city is intact. Yeah. It still can produce. You don't have to work to repair anything. You don't have to clean bodies off the street, etc. No. Even Sun Tzu in The Art of War uh, advises against attacking the cities by assault if you don't have any other option. Like the number you provide really does radically change the whole narrative that Jerusalem was a massacre. Like that was a huge number. Yeah, let's also consider how in the last church when Uriah was in his soldier days and when he and his men were fighting against the Thunder Warriors on the Battle of 
Ah, I, I can't recall the battlefield, but yeah, well, I, I don't recall that either. But but yeah, I remember. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So because as some of you may know, it's like within the story, fifty thousand men went up to fight against the Thunder Warriors, and when as soon as they realized that they had no chance, when the first rank fell from their bolters, they re- they realized, oh, we're way of our league. Yeah, the Thunder Warriors didn't allow them to surrender. They literally slaughtered 50,000 men in Orion's words, maybe less than an hour. Yeah, the most definitely. It's always, it's kind of funny that if you're talking about massacres, it's kind of rich coming from the Emperor. <laughs> Just saying. If the Emperor wants to, to like, if the Emperor wants to make a point against something by using a, Brut, uh, warfare brutality as kind of like the arguing the the argument the point of the argument it's kind of rich coming from him <laughs> when you consider that yeah so that whole that only Raya took part of oh, sorry oh no but no uh, it's like we're both imperial citizens but it's like it's just fine that the emperor likes to wave the finger but it's like dude you're no different just stop <laughs> yes pretty much um in, yeah, um, like that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of people to die then in less than an hour. Fifty thousand. Um, okay, so that's like a very, very brief, <laughs> brief overview of yeah. the Emperor's point on the Crusades. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, like you said, if we were to talk about, if we were to talk about like every single element of the story, I think this podcast would take like a little bit too long. So. But that was a really great history lesson, though. Thank you. Though I am curious, um, if you could maybe just briefly tell the audience, like, well, then again, what what you told us about the Crusades is actually far more detailed than what the Emperor could have provided in the story, and something I think people have too many misconceptions of. Yet I think people still have no idea about what exactly the Inquisition is, because the Emperor does bring that up. Because yeah, and here's the. Thing. like it was something like for what i find interesting about him especially bringing up the inquisition is that because you know 4k is famous for its own inquisition so in a way it's almost like a irony that he, he would talk about an organization that was so horrible in his own point of view only to have it be part of his imperium like de- millennium later yeah but, also to call his great military campaign a great crusade yeah. after he told us oh the crusades were horrible yeah but uh I am curious, though, if you could briefly describe it for us. What exactly is the Inquisition? Because I think too many people have not the greatest ideas about what exactly it was. Like, what is it? Okay. The Inquisition was, well, several uh, organizations because there is not one Inquisition. Uh, they change with the time period, they changed their mode of operation, their headquarters, and everything. So much so that there is not one Inquisition, that mm-hmm. there is not one, like, all-encompassing encompassing Inquisition. There's several through different time periods. It's like um, it's like when someone say the Roman Empire. It's like, well, which one? There's been multiple yeah, different Roman empires. One? <laughs> Roman empires, yeah. Which one? Um the Inquisition has its origins on the, with the Albigensian Crusade. If you think a normal crusade is like complex and long, the Albigensian Crusade is a complete and utter, um, can I swear in this? You can't, no, I, you won't get in trouble. Like I'm on clutch rosary. <laughs> a complete and utter clusterfuck. <laughs> Like even even the people at the time that participated in it and that organized it looked back upon it and said, "Yeah, that was a complete another mess, right? We 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 fucked up in that one." Yeah. The Albigensian Crusade was a sort of crusade against a her- uh, heretical sect that was uh, that had to the county of Toulouse in southern France and actual in modern uh, southern France. Uh, up in revolt because it was like uh, very entrenched into the social fabric of it, and a lot of the nobles themselves had uh, either themselves were Cathars or oh, yeah. had um, or had themselves uh, sympathies for the Cathars or were protecting them. Uh, it's 
honestly, like I said, it is a complete and utter mess and only talking about it will take me too long. So yeah. to make the story short, um, the Inquisition, the, the Inquisition was founded after the other mess that was the Albigensian crusade, uh, to root out and combat heresy without the necessity to having, of having to call a military action upon the heretics because armies aren't known for, for being very precise mm -hmm. in, well, what they do, you know? Um, and to be honest, like having, and the Albigensian crusade was such a mess that confused that the religious intentions, the, the religious intentions, the political and territorial disputes, succession laws, since this was an entire mess, the, the, the papacy was like, yeah, never, we're not doing that ever again, you know? Mm -hmm. So what did they do? They created a new office, which that is kind of like a mixture between a detective and a judge called the Inquisitor. Now, the Inquisitor, the Inquisitor's job was to root out heresy and they were very effective at it. The Inquisitor, um, uh, the Inquisitor. Oh, sorry. What? Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, this also this kind of reminds me if I, if I'm allowed to make a comparison. Um, you watched the Disney film of Hunchback of Notre Dame, right? Yeah. Um, for the movie version, um, they made Frollo into a judge. With yeah. with you just provided, would it be fair if we also gave him like a sort of Inquisitor type of vibe? Like, would that be fair? I think like. If you're talking Inquisitor in the pop culture sort of conception, then yes, although he is clearly a secular judge in this one. Um, well, of course, like he is the judge, but just in my opinion, like. Uh, yeah, like that's, I think that's what's kind of the mood Disney wanted to go, go to without having to explain to children what an Inquisitor is. So yeah, it's actually a fair comparison of the average image that the average person has of an inquisitor mm -hmm. pretty much the the inquisitor job was a reconciliation with the church the thing was that heresy uh, was like well a tree <laughs> much like <laughs> much like 40k itself said mm -hmm. that and uh, normally it was a very localized phenomenon the problem with heresy is that heresy is uh error an error in dogma or doctrine that's not, well, pretty much not, uh, not true, basically. Uh, yeah, not true, basically. Or, uh, lie. or either a lie or simply unsanctioned to the, to the point of this is, this was not seen by the church as, oh, religious diversity. This was seen as a cancer growing inside of it mm -hmm. simply because if you're, if people are following, uh, some, 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 of a pointed uh, prophet that uses part part of you know of Christianity's doctrine, but then gives a completely different, but then changes the message into something else entirely. Very well, the church was like these people are going to hell because they are literally following a false prophet. You know, so mm -hmm. that's what the church was afraid of. It was more about simply control. Like we look as people on the modern age, look upon religious uh, motivation for doing stuff with, ex with skepticism. But like I said, context is everything. Mm -hmm. And to the people of the middle ages, believe me, they, to them, a religious motivation for doing stuff was pretty sincere. Uh, and if you, they saw normally the success of their endeavors, either success in battle or success in whatever, or in their business or whatever, as God's favor upon them. So those things were not separated from one another. And so what happened? What happens then? So the church says, oh, these, these heretical sects are going to lead people into damnation. They were wolves in sheep's clothing. If you get, if you, if you understand the, yeah, of the course. comparison. Um, it's like, uh, sorry, to, sorry if I could say thing. No. It's not like heresy, it's not like heresy to them is someone deciding not to go to church on a Sunday or something like that. It's when you're, it's when you're telling masses of people to like not follow the creeds of Catholicism or 
not follow any of God's sacraments or stuff like that. It's like that's that's what heresy is it, with the context of something like this. It's, it's also – yes, but it also – heresy it tends to be like – new and exciting so people kind of like flocked to it because they saw this like kind of new doctrine that was kind of like new and shiny in comparison to the to the orthodox that was a thing to the more orthodox approach which was like uh the thing an everyday thing so people often just said oh yeah i'm totally in for that thing even if they themselves didn't actually believe it you know or like they let themselves be exposed to it uh the thing is um the thing is it was also seen as an act of arrogance so, so like the lord gave us our doctrine is based on the teachings of the lord so so and now you and now some rando guy would some well untrained priest much like uriah <laughs> uh it's now going to say that oh no he is the one who has the true interpretation and you know so that's why it's heretical because since the message has already been given someone someone trying to change it because no no that's the real thing that's what's uh that's what's can could lead people into damnation mm -hmm. <laughs> but i'm diverging uh the inquisitor the inquis inquisitor's job was as such rooting out heresy okay how the inquisition Root out heresy. Okay. Inquisitors during the Middle Ages would normally go into a uh, town su suspected of heresy, report town or region suspected of harboring heretic heretical activity with an entourage. Um, they would, they would walk, report to the local authorities and ask for their cooperation. And then he will set up an inquisition, which was kind of like a tribunal. Mm -hmm. Uh, then he would preach a sermon on the evils of heresy and on the righteousness and righteousness and of repentance and the forgiveness and mercy of God and, and, uh, invite people to invite people to come with confessions or testimonies about any suspected heretical activity. Normally, you see, normally this was enough. <laughs> That's where it ended because the social pressure of that normally made like heretical, heretical sex simply come forward and, and be like, Oh, I repent. Sometimes heretics didn't even realize that they were doing anything wrong after, until the inquisitor informed them that they were. The inquisition's um, objective was reconciliation, not punishment, not uh, executions. Normally, heretical, heretic people condemned of heresy will simply be reconciled and may, and made to do a penitence depending on the severity or the severity or of the, or of the heresy or how much if they relapsed or failed to, or failed to confess even under, even themselves under uh, suspicion. In fact, our modern investigation techniques that that stipulate as a suspect being innocent until, pro until proven guilty guess who developed them the inquisition yep um the thing is that the inquisition is normally portrayed as this uh horrifying like, uh, ruthless radical uh, side of people yeah yeah but not only the inquisition was very legalistic but the Inquisition itself not only hardly used, while well, the Inquisition was allowed to use torture, it was known, it was a rarity because Inquisitors being part of the clergy, rightfully so, thought, well, this thing is what torture is barbaric. Um, it was, like I said, a rarity and like, and like they're allowed to. to. That, so sorry, like they're allowed to, but at the same time, really shouldn't, basically. Yeah, pretty much. The thing was that inquisitors themselves, um, inquisitors themselves took, uh, were very skeptical of confessions under torture. Why? Because everybody knows, simply by reasoning it, everybody knows that anyone that confesses anything under torture is obviously just saying whatever they want to hear in order for, in order for, to get them to stop. It's like, like everybody. Oh, sorry. 
Oh yeah, no. Um, it's like someone crushing, literally crushing your thumbs with vice grips. Is more likely to tell you anything you want to hear than tell the truth. Than tell the actual truth. It's like I, I suspect you of stealing from me, and he's crushing his finger. Despite the fact that he never stole anything, he'll he'll say yes, I did. Just stop. Mm-hmm, yeah, like if he's pretty much so. If he said the opposite, the guy would just keep going until he's hear what he wants to hear. Yes, pretty much. Also, while this changes depending on which Inquisition we're talking about, I'm talking about right now about the medieval one. Uh, the later ones, more the more developed ones, the Spanish and the Roman Inquisition, yeah, the I most think, famous one is the Spanish one. Yeah, Nobody expects it. The Spanish one is probably the most famous of the Inquisitions, I think. Uh, so, briefly touch on why is it that the Spanish Inquisition is like this in-your-face poster boys? Inquisition. So why is that? Mostly because since the the Spanish Inquisition is normally credited with everything the Inquisition did, even though it didn't actually exist at the time, um, which is kind of uh, which is kind of hilarious. The emperor actually makes this mistake. The emperor first calls the Inquisition as a result of the Albigensian Crusade, which it is. That's true. And he then calls it, oh, they want a reign of terror, of burning heretics, and et cetera, and et cetera, you know? And then they turn to hunting witches into this massive witch craze hysteria, you know, the classic example. Yeah. But the emperor gets this wrong, well, because he's talking about one inquisition, and then he's talking about another one, and he calls them the same thing. Um, the one that was a part of the Albigensian Crusade was the medieval Inquisition, and the one that existed during the witch hunt craze that assailed Europe was the Spanish Inquisition and the and the Roman Inquisition. But that was the but the Spanish Inquisition is the most important. Here's the thing: um, the Spanish Inquisition is the most famous of one for two for two reasons. It, w- it rose to prominence after, for a couple of reasons, sorry. It rose to prominence when uh, Spain was literally on the top of the world with establishing their huge, uh, their huge universal monarchy. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, its most prominent, its most prominent moment was during the height of the Reformation and the religion wars of Europe between Catholics and Protestants. So, what did yeah, they, I heard about this. Yeah, what, yeah. So what happened? The thing is, it's very well accepted by the experts of the subject. There's a great documentary about it done by the BBC of all people. Uh-huh. That's surprising. Um, yeah, that's surprising. Yeah, I know. Uh, Anglican news. What was? Ah, yeah. So what happened is that the great. Uh, Spain was the great Catholic power of the era. And who were the great Protestant powers of the era? England. Uh, England and, and the Netherlands. Mm. The, those were the great Protestant era. So the image of the atrocious Inquisition that literally kills people arbitrarily at the slightest provocation and they call witchcraft or heresy to anything, you sneeze and you get burned in the stake, burned at the stake. Yeah, that's a propaganda, uh, propaganda campaign by England and uh, the Netherlands. And like I said, that's, it's hilarious that there actually, there's a very good documentary, documentary where one of the actually leading academic authorities on the whole Inquisition subject, a uh, historian by the name of Henry Kramer, I think that's how his name is pronounced. Um, yeah, Henry Kamen. Um, British, uh, British historian, PhD from Oxford. Yeah. Um, when in which he appears, uh, I actually read his book. It's actually a very, very, um, good read if you re- like re- reading history books. But the thing about the Spanish one is that it, it's mostly because of that. Mm-hmm. It, the time period when it happened and who and the smearing campaign that it, that it was prone to, you know. Um, the thing is, and this also pertains to the medieval Inquisition. Y- did you know that inquisitorial torture, n- torture sessions could not only were a rarity and heavily discouraged 
for the reasons I already yeah. discussed. For all these reasons, yeah. Also, yeah, but also they had a time limit. They had There had to be a medical expert always present. There could be no injury, no permanent injury done to the subject. And they only counted with three torture methods, mm -hmm. three. And none of them are were Iron Maidens or Brazen Balls. The torture method, methods were the rack, which pretty much stretches you. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. The rack is probably a clear image for everyone. They, yeah, they the rack is... <laughs> sorry. No, uh, the rack is probably a clear image from anybody who probably watched any kind of medieval cartoon, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. That was a real one. That that was a, a real torture method, yes. The next one was one called uh, the Stropado, which pretty much entitled meant that you would get tied, uh, your hands would get tied behind your back, and you would get hung from a rope from your wrist and pulled and be, you know, pulled from the ground with a lever like you were a human piñata. Yeah. And left suspended there, and the pressure that would that would cause in your arms would, over time, become unbearable. So, yeah. uh, and then the water cure, which the the victim was made to drink large, large quantities of water in a very short time. Oh yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. Uh, so while these are still torture torture methods, these still are. Uh, are harsh. They are very far cry from <clears throat> getting tossed inside an Iron Maiden, getting, getting tossed inside a boiling cauldron, getting roasted inside a brazen bowl, you know, getting your, your fingernails, uh, uh, you know, ripped off. That's a very far cry from it. And the fact that they themselves were very reluctant to use them, like, uh, spoke that even then, uh, they didn't have a very high opinion of it here like i think that paints a clear image on what the inquisition is so i don't think we need to go make the making this into a medieval podcast if that's <laughs> if that's all right i'm saying um yeah just want to clear something out the emperor also states that the inquisition was uh was responsible for which burning craze when, yeah, no, that's a blame and light inquisition was uh, established exactly, um, to the presence of the inquisition in several countries actually was what prevented the witch hunting craze because the inquisition and the Catholic church in general, the emperor blames the inquisition for the witch hunting craze, uh, um, in that happened in Europe and all the witch burnings. But the thing is, the witch burnings themselves were not done by the Inquisition. They were mostly done in larger num. The largest numbers were done in Protestant countries and the uh, and uh, and while well, it happened in Catholic countries as well, the Inquisition had nothing to do with them. It was mostly popular hysteria. The in Spain, actually, you know how many cases. Out of this, all the centuries the Inquisition existed, you know how many, like three centuries, you know how many, uh, what's the, how many cases were, uh, pertaining to witch hunting? About 8%. And over three, like three centuries. 8% of the cases were witch burnings. Is that what you're trying to say? No, well, like only the cases were, the cases themselves were about pertaining to witchcraft, but you need, but something, most inquisition cases didn't end with an execution. Oh. First off, because the objective of the Inquis inquisitor was to convert, to reconcile them, reconcile. The, you know, to reconcile the person with the church. And second, because, uh, technically the inquisition never killed anyone because the executions of heretics or witches and whatever, were not even done by the Inquisition themselves. They were surrendered into the to the secular powers, and the secular powers were free to do with them as they wished. And the secular powers simply, more often than not, simply executed them. Inquisitorial uh, penance could range from something more religious, like doing a penance after a confession, or paying a fine, or a prison sentence, or or wearing a mark of shame, a public mark of shame, etc. But 
executions were also not only rare, but they were seen as abject failures. Yeah, that is quite interesting, actually. And I think I got more information out of you than what the education system here could have provided. So definitely, you. So, de- so definitely an awesome lesson on that end. And again, just so that this podcast doesn't become something like a medieval history podcast, um, <laughs> I do honestly want to ask that we obviously talked about the positives of the whole stories of the last church. Um, there was this one famous line near the end of the story that did kind of annoy you and annoyed you and annoyed me, especially with the context of the store book version, book version, because the, the animated version did a better job on the final argument that the emperor makes being that yeah. if people go to heaven in your, in your religion, why are people afraid to die then? Like that's something I see people always bring up time and time again to try to debunk the other side. It's like, Lamau, you go to heaven. Why are you afraid of death? Mm, okay. This is actually pretty simple. And also it kind for me, it kind of shows why the emperor is pretty much an abject failure at being just a man. Like if the emperor had from the get go said, Oh, I am your God, Lord and savior. <laughs> I think it, things would have worked out better for him <laughs> because it shows that the emperor has never been human because he has never had to fear uh, the realities that a human must face. People, I actually talked to a, to a friend of the family who is a priest, um, a very intelligent man. So uh, I asked him what was his opinion on this. And he was like, well, because we're, we're mortal creatures and our instinct is self-preservation. And exactly because of that, it's very a very natural thing that even if you are the man of the most unshakable faith in God, the afterlife, reincarnation, whatever you want, whatever you want to um, subscribe yourself to, um, it's it's um, it's natural because instinctually we're programmed to run from things that might cause of de- cause us to die. We That's avoid the, them. We avoid talking about them. Oh, sorry, Lewis. Oh, no, no problem. Man. I don't mean to interrupt. It's kind of like the natural instincts of fight, run, or freeze. Yeah, pretty much so. We are programmed instinctually to run away from death. We avoid uh, situations that might put us in harm because we're afraid it might kill us. We avoid talking about our mortality because it's simply better not to think about it. It's a better way to, to deal with it with every day. And so, uh, and if you want to put it into a religious perspective, um, um, the, the, pri- the priest told me himself that, well, life is the first gift that we receive. So of course we are very, uh, protective of it. It's natural that we are, even if, and even a person, like I said, very unshakable faith that it's willing almost to die a martyr for his religious beliefs. Always himself, he says that goes with a trench of fear, not even because he's about to die, because now there's this, all these questions about, am I going to go to heaven? Was I worthy enough? Uh, I was, was I a good enough person to be, to see, truly see the other side? That also takes a factor into consideration when someone's facing, well, the end of their mortal, ex- of their mortal lives, you know, pretty much it shows that the emperor himself is not a man and he has never been just a man because he just doesn't understand people, humans. He doesn't understand humans at that basic fundamental level. Mm-hmm. Like maybe now that he's on the golden throne, maybe he does, you know, but, uh, after he kind of experienced death. But at the same time, it's like um, people stop being afraid of things through exposure. Mm-hmm. Like we, a kid might be afraid of going, of getting on a roller coaster the first time around. But after he finally faces his fear, he goes on a roller co- roller coaster mm-hmm. and he loses his fear of it. Mm-hmm. But the problem is we cannot do that because we only die once. So we can, we do not, we do not get the benefit of repetition, unlike with everything else. It's like, this might be silly if I'm doing the comparison of Deadpool, but 
with a character like Deadpool, it's like, this is a guy who just literally can't die. Nothing can kill him. So, of course, he's not going to be so concerned about his safety like other superheroes might be thinking about. So, that is right. It's like, something like death is something you only experience once over. Yeah, pretty much. It makes sense that... Uh, it makes sense that a character like Deadpool will not care simply because he has died many times. So it's just another normal experience for him. But since we only do that once, then it stands to argue while, while we're terrified of it, whatever your religious beliefs are. So, um, yeah, like even if you think you go to heaven, even if you, your family thinks that you go to heaven, and even if they think that they will see you again, and that in a such a way, they should be happy to some place. It's not like the emperor says that deep down, you don't believe what you believe, what you say you believe. It's deep down, you're a human that's naturally built to be, to protect life. And when faced with, and when faced with at the end of that mortal ex- mortal life, then there's always a fear of it. You know, it sort of comes with the package of being a human being. Except that maybe the Emperor never had that part of being a package. And like the whole thing that you told me about of people being afraid of death, because again, that's something people only experience once. It it really does remind me of that scene in Horus, no, not Horus Rising, um, False Gods, when Horus fell from yeah. the blade of Nurgle. Um, that's probably the first time that any Primarch has experienced something like that, and something probably mm-hmm. his own legion would experience. So, and the Remembrancers who were there, who saw this happen, were shook into a core because it's like, oh, this is impossible. This is something that just can't happen to a Primarch, and some of these people who were like brought up to believe in the imperial truth who probably you know never worshipped a god who never got an experience of religion who were always probably taught in history class that it's a dead thing that humans once practice like in ancient history these po- these people probably like i said these people probably never experience like religious faith or anything like that but as soon as he fell, they turned to the person who was a religious person who did believe in something like the emperor being God. They turned to him because they wanted the comfort of, oh, there's the imperial truth can't tell me how to cope with something like this or stuff like that. If, yeah. you, if you see what I'm trying to say. Yeah, definitely. Also, it's kind of ironic because the imperial truth is by all intents and purposes, a religion all of its own. When you can think about it, it almost... They talk about it as if it was a religion. Mm -hmm. They preach about it like it was a religion. It's a godless religion, but it kind of still works like one. And there's this theory that the emperor was creating a chaos god of unbelief. And so, like, when you take that into consideration, it's kind of like more, even more ironic than the, it's, it's even more ironic than it actually, than it ended up, ended up being in canon when you consider that, you know, that even the emperor trying to, uh, even the emperor when trying to like eliminate a religion was technically still participating in one, you know? I actually heard a good theory about this from 1d4chan when the website was still up. No longer anymore. I so- think it's back up. Oh, it is? I, I think so. But yeah, I have a, yeah, I have it open right here. Oh, interesting. But interesting. But um, what I find interesting is that within One D Four Chan, they did a whole theory that near the end of the story, when the Emperor was bringing down the church, Orion looked at him, asking him, "Once you conquer the whole galaxy, how can people not see you as God?" There was this like so moment of pause where maybe Oraya and the Emperor had a moment, and the, and he realized that what if this was his goal that he'll conquer the galaxy and eventually because he, people will turn to him as god even if he yeah. even even if throughout the whole crusade he denied them that he is god especially to his son logar like oraya said denying people something will only make them want to pursue it more mm-hmm. so perhaps this whole great crusade or at least from the theory 
and perhaps even the Horus Heresy, was a whole setup to mar the Emperor so that people will eventually see him as God. Because something like the Horus Heresy does sound like its own version of Paradise Lost in a way. Yeah, pretty much. It's I always said that the Horus Heresy is pretty much the biblical war in heaven, but with assault rifles and spaceships. <laughs> yes. and, pretty much so. But like I've said in the video earlier, The Last Church is, in, is itself an interesting story, and I think it has done what the author intended in you know, starting debates like this for people to talk about the Emperor's ambitions, was he justified and stuff like this. I think this story provided more, what I'm trying to say, it's provided way to say, I think. And for the most part, I think it's done a good job. Like, I think it's done a interesting job on doing something like that. Yeah, when it actually comes to the actual topic of what religion has done in the past and with the specific examples the Emperor has brought up, it does show its weakest side. And maybe it's not because of the Emperor himself not knowing, because of course he would have known if he hadn't been with humanity during all this time. Yet maybe at the same time, this could also be the fault of the author. Like, Graham McNeil is a great author, but again, writers can make mistakes. Yeah, definitely. I actually find myself enjoying uh, the story far more than I thought I would, because I I knew all, like, this whole, um, well, not controversy, but all these uh, reputations that the last church has uh, mm -hmm. in certain aspects about what well, the arguments, uh, the arguments are sort of, are sort of very basic or mm -hmm. not, uh, not very, they're not very complex. Um, the story as a story, you know, as a something dramatic, something that uh, an exchange between characters. Mm -hmm. I liked it actually quite more than I thought I would. And yes, Graham McNeil is a great author. That's there's no doubt about that. Um, and yes, that authors can make make mistakes. Honestly, um, also we need to also keep in consideration yeah. that well, like we established the emperor for all the things we he might have known. He maybe was simply saying what he. Not what was the objective truth, which is another point of irony mm -hmm. for the emperor, considering that he calls his ideology an imperial truth, truth, but he was simply acting on his biases because, well, we all have them. But uh, at the same time, it's also Uriah doesn't make a very good case for himself either. And there's a lot of other things we could talk about a lot of other minutia we could like talk about that we would be here for like yeah four or five hours like yeah. i have i haven't even begun talking about the inquisition or the, or the yeah. crusades or and that's not even talking about it was uh, mere brush it was a mere brush yeah. of exposure to what they were <laughs> yeah, definitely um m most definitely yeah uh i definitely say that i wanted to bring you on to the show because i wanted to hear more stuff about like self of inquisition and crusades because with something like this brought up in the story and because there is the sort of believed myth of the idea that i feel like something like people like you could actually clear up for the audience if something that maybe stories such as these probably gets wrong way too often yeah it, um it, 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 like like the belief that columbus discovered america or the belief that everyone back then believed the world was flat it's like it's myths like that that sort of does harm to the idea of history yeah most definitely but, yeah and people in the middle ages didn't believe the world was flat yeah. we have known the we have known the planet is round since the time of the ancient greeks and so that's another one for you yeah. um I think people. Uh, um, oh, so sorry. Um, I think people like to believe myths more than they would like to maybe open up a history book and get the experience themselves. I honestly think. Be, I honestly think it's. Um, I only. I think it's a two. It's a double edged problem because on the one hand, people seem to be not interested in history, but at the same time. They kind of do, but not like not in depth. So we live in this age of information when, where instead of 
there being not information on a subject, there's too much of it. So people do not know where to begin searching. And when they do, it's not exactly the most accessible. For example, one of my main uh, sources for the story of the crusade is of the crusades is a book called god's war by uh christopher T- tyerman tierman i don't know how that's pronounced mm-hmm. um uh he was pretty much was because he died some years ago but uh an, the one of the authorities on the subject you know like this is the guy that you mm-hmm. This is the guy that knows his stuff. This is the one you ask questions to. Mm-hmm. But his magnum opus, God's War, which I'm holding in my hand right now, it's a monster of a book. We're yeah. talking about mm, a big book with a with like. It's like if you thought taking World War II class in high school was like a Bible worth of information, I can imagine this guy's is twice that length. Thousand twenty. Three pages. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, that's sure. You're certainly going to get your money's worth out of that book. That's yes, for sure. Def- most definitely. <laughs> Th- there's one thing I want, one more thing I want to bring up about something like Last Church and the whole idea of the Emperor and his Great Crusade. Of course, there's the irony of it, but there is one thing I want to talk about and his idea of the Imperial Truth saying that. The world is only run by science and all that. There's no such thing as gods and all that. With something like this, where let's not consider it's the question of God in the saying of 4 k like the monotheistic one. With something like chaos, they are something that do exist. They're, mm-hmm. they're something that we can interact with, can talk to. We see their demons. They exist. Yet with the Emperor's Imperial Truth, he sort of had made this thing to almost hide them away. Like, he knows they exist, yet, is this really a truth that he's spreading to people, or is this more like an imperial lie? Like, I can understand that if you were to tell people that, hey, there's this thing called chaos, if you were to interact with it, it will do this and do this and do this, so don't do it. That would get people interested, yet at the same time, what would be the cause of lies? Mm-hmm. Like I said, I think like people sometimes theorize that the intention behind the imperial truth was like ma- to make to start out chaos mm-hmm. because apparently the emperor believes that uh, faith makes chaos stronger. But instead of emotions, which um, we know that that's what chaos feeds in, like, feeds upon. Like Slash herself was created because of the. Eldar's excessive emotions. Mm -hmm. I think that I I said it. er, I said this earlier. I think things would have worked better for the Emperor against chaos if he quite literally started out saying, "Oh yeah, I am. I am your new god." People like if he started out, if the Imperial Truth was the Imperial the Imperial Creed, but written by him, you know. If from the get go, like, because we have seen that imper- that faith in the emperor actually harms chaos. If the emperor, th- this is a theory of mine, if the emperor has started out saying that, yeah, I'm a god, I'm your savior, you know, worship me instead, and had like given context to chaos as pretty much the devil, because that's what chaos mm-hmm. is pretty much. Um, like you see a corn demon, that's obviously the devil. It's not that yeah, hard. That's all, yeah, the realm of chaos is hell. Like there, there's no, you don't need to reason very much from it. It's literally hell. So yeah, I see a um, blood letter. That's literally how we would probably see a demon or something like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, demon of Slanesh is literally a succubus. Um, so. And if the emperor had like Marcubus. given, uh, <laughs> yeah, or maybe both. So, sorry, what? Or maybe both. Or maybe both. Yeah. If the emperor kind of like uh, my theory is that if the emperor had like literally that is have set up himself as the savior of mankind in a divine way, and much like Lorgar believed said he was, and like planted to people the idea of chaos as this great enemy from the start. Like this is the devil, reject the lives of the devil, 
much like it is in modern 40k but from the start mm-hmm. i think things would have worked out better for him but that's just a theory of mine because we also know that simply telling to people hey this is chaos don't listen to it because in the book horus rising we actually horus and his legion they actually did counter a plant in which they know of chaos like the enterx right huh the enterx i believe they were called oh, okay if that's their name or not but i i'm taking a word for it because i don't remember but they literally did tell their people hey this is what chaos is don't and this is how it works and they were basically dumbfounded that they countered another human population that constantly travels through the warp yet we're ignorant of what chaos is and yeah like if the emperor had done like uh like the people of yes they weren't like as advanced as the imperium of man like they were only a few cluster of planets yes yet they were probably a lot more safe than what the imperium was and with the imperium's influence at the time of having almost all of the galaxy when people eventually found out what chaos was and when they found out what they could get out of it that caused a lot more harm than he could have ever believed in or could have thought would happen yes definitely the sheer size of, size of the imperium makes sure that the when a cataclysm occurs uh, in inside of it or pertaining to it it's always going to be enormous as they say pride comes before the fall and well the imperium was too arrogant to give notice to chaos until it was too late mostly through the emperor's own fault and even the emperor while the imperial truth was the dominant was the dominant ideology of the imperium the emperor even back then still acted pretty much as a god completely unquestioned by anyone like don't question me like it makes sense if a god is a if a transcendent all-knowing entity immortal entity tells you not to question him because he knows more than you it makes uh, some sense why are you going to tell the omnipotent all-knowing entity that he doesn't know but if you present yourself as only being a man but then ask that, oh, don't question me, this is above your pay grade. Well, that's kind of a point of conflict over there, because if you're a man, then you're open to being questioned, you know? And people took to question you a lot when they find out what chaos is, and mm-hmm. when they and when they find out that you decide to go home to create something called the Golden Throne. Yeah, pretty much so. It, it, this really does remind me of, like, Chernobyl, where, you know, the TV show, I mean, yeah, where the famous lines near the end were, one where I once would fear the cause of truth, now I only ask was the cause of lies, and mm-hmm. that's something I br- I brought up in my Imperium of Man lore video, where by the cause of his lies and because he did his whole mission walking through a tightrope, it was that cause of lies that caused everyone to crumble down on you. And didn't just affect you, it affected everyone within the galaxy. Yeah, pretty much so. Like, every good ideology, every religion worth it advises against lying because lies are like a avalanche. They start out small, then they turn into... Then they... But they... Then they grow so big that they could, um, you know, bury entire towns or even cities you know and so and and with the context of this it bared the entire galaxy pretty much so and oh well oh sorry sorry, unless it was part of the unless it was all part of the plan (laughs) i really hate that if they if it was like all this whole part of the plan um well i think black library should understand is that make the emperor human it's Like, it's all right if he had good motivations, yet it all just didn't work out for him. It's something like that that makes a Greek tragedy, I find, and something I think would Mm -hmm. make it even more interesting. A person who wanted to do good ended up causing so much harm that it literally became worse than hell. Because people who pursue heaven are most likely to make a hell on earth. 
basically. Yeah, very much. I think that, uh, like, to call the emperor human, like, I think it's 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 strange because for what we discussed earlier, the emperor is not human simply because he doesn't understand humans with the whole concept of mortality. But at the same time, the emperor, as we've seen, is prone to arrogance, miscalculation, uh, aloofness, etc. All human traits. So he is I human in that, that sense. Is, yeah, he's human in that sense, definitely. So the emperor. Yeah, I mean, if Black Library came up with a way that I I wouldn't like that he that this was all part of the plan, but I would like that the Emperor kind of like had his moment, his moment of sort of redemption. Not that he fixes everything, that mm-hmm. but that he managed to salvage enough to like. To be the god that all the that all his worshippers in the modern Imperium believe him to be, to be to you know, truly the Emperor truly protecting, you know, having his redemptive moment for so to speak. I, I would like that. Not necessarily that he fixes everything, but he salvages enough to make it bittersweet. That that's what I would imagine mm-hmm. uh 40k's ending to be. Yeah. Because 40k isn't like, um, this will, because 40k doesn't really necessarily have an end, like, but nothing's all good and nothing's all evil. Well, for most cases, depending on what faction you're talking about, because faction, because chaos is definitely the all black faction. But I think of what's important is that 40k is bittersweet. It's like, like like what you just said, if it was like a bittersweet ending to the whole Horus heresy, I think that would make a better impact than a black or white ending. Have a bittersweet ending. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I think that I, I completely agree with you, man. Like I wouldn't want a completely black ending because on the one hand, and we all experience... We have experienced all these characters, and if the whole black ending is, oh, well, they all die. Mm-hmm. Well, that was very anticlimactic, you know, but uh, all white ending would be like, oh, and everything was fixed, even though the, the things were fucked up beyond belief, but now we fixed everything. Yeah, it needs to be a bittersweet ending, like having having lost a lot of things still, but still having some hope for the future. I don't know. So... I I agree on that on that with you definitely. Not to hold you up forever, but I think there will be this one last part of the story I want to talk about with you, um, and that's the symbolism of Orion's clock. Because as some of you may know, Orion's clock is said to ring when the world has ended, and near the end of the story, when the emperor has burned down the last church of Terra, the in his ear he hears the chiming of a broken clock. So there's obviously the symbolism of that, of ev- that when the church has fell, the world has officially ended, or at least the old world, the world that believed in something like religion or God, something like that. So in my point of view, and I want to get your point of view, point of view on this symbolism of that later, with that clock, when it has chimed, in my point of view, I think it does symbolize that the world has indeed ended in the sort of revelation kind of sense. And I think later, like the world has ended, but what would come later is a hell. Like hell on earth, literally of what would come after the events of the Horus Heresy. If you see what I'm trying to go at? Yeah, most definitely. Um, the clock tick peeled mid... Uh, the clock peeled till midnight. Um, the world ended, and everyone was damned. That's what you're going at. Something like that. Yeah, everyone was damned, and now we're all here in hell. Mm-hmm. And ever now, everyone. Have you heard the phrase like, "Hell is empty because all the demons are here"? No, I haven't heard about. I haven't heard about. Uh, like well, that. Yeah, but I, I once heard that. I don't remember where I heard that one, but that's how I how I. <laughs> and my, uh, that's how I, I sometimes 
assign that to 40k like hell is empty because all the demons are here mm-hmm. and in 40k that's sort of more literal now than ever yeah rather you're talking about the hell that is the imperium of man or the hell that is the warp <laughs> i think both <laughs> i once re- i think once you asked me about uh about how I once told you about how my favorite classic book is uh, Dante's Divine Comedy, mm-hmm. and that everyone in the Imperium is either a re- in the Imperium, well, in the whole setting, actually, not only the Imperium. Um, it's either a resident of the fifth or seventh circle of hell, mm-hmm. where, being where in the fifth circle, they all, they're all drowning in this thick and swamp, swampy mm-hmm. marsh of wrath you know yeah, yeah. where they cannot escape but in the seventh circle they're all being boiling alive kid punching each other tearing each other's flesh and skin in a river of in a river of blood because th- that's a circle of violence that's that's mine kind of like my allegorical interpretation of 40k yeah when i was originally going to try to do a video on this that wasn't a podcast i thought i would use that as a symbolism of what exactly the 40k saying is when in the context of the last church with symbolism and all that in which everyone like you said is in this like pool of blood of wrath basically pretty much so also considering how the emperor calls himself calls himself revelation Mm -hmm. like he refers refers himself as revelation to uriah he obviously thinks like he is the harbinger of like at least a metaphorical end of days for him, but I think it's a, he brought a more literal end of days, yeah, for everyone, especially with the clock ring when the world has ended. That yeah, the world that actually does make sense now if you think of it. That the the clock will tick when the world has ended, and Revelation has ended the world. Yeah, pretty much so. Though in the book he's called Revelation, and the book he. And the uh, in the animated he animated version he's called Apocalypso or something like that. Uh, Apocalypse actually means revelation in Greek. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, that's what's called the Book of the Apocalypse, the Book of Revelation. It's meant it's talking about the same thing because that's the translation. Revelation mm-hmm. means uh, apocalypse means revelation, much like uh, for example. Abaddon, like referring to Abaddon, is the character. Is Greek spoiler. for is Greek for Apollyon, yeah. Apollyon, which is also Hebrew for destroyer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. With all that, I think we've talked about everything that needs to be said and everything that needs to be talked about. Is there anything you'd like to say, Hubert? Um. Well. The Black Templar are fin- Black Templar are finally coming, and so I'm very <laughs> happy for that. Um, go and read more history books, people, because they give you they illuminate the world you live in. Most definitely, they inspire your imagination. <laughs> but and thank you so much for coming on to the show, sir. Yeah, no, thanks, thank you, my man, thank you, man. Uh, uh, it's been a real honor that you that you had me here. Thank you very much. I most certainly had an excellent time. Thank you so much. Always, whatever you need. And with all said and done, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all again next week with a brand new video. Have a good day, everyone. And if you enjoyed this video and you would like to subscribe, then make sure to activate the bell notification button so you'll never miss an episode. And if you enjoy this video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing, and I'll see you again soon. Have a good one.